Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, just uh, opening up the feed. Uh, we will start at 9.30. Uh, so we'll just continue this feed until 9.30 when we start so people can come on in. Once again, we're just opening the feed right now. Uh, we're going to start at 9.30. Uh, we're just waiting for people to come on in. Just for the people that are joining, uh, like I say, we're just opening the feed right now. We will start at 9.30. Uh, for the folks that are in here, if somebody can just uh, put a chat in there saying that they can hear me clearly, I just want to make sure everything's working because I can't see that side of it. The sound is kind of muffled. Thank you. How about now, can you hear me a little better? Someone said 100%. Okay, sorry I had to turn my dishwasher off. be a little louder please. If there's still any volume issues, what I would suggest is just to increase the volume on your uh, computers. Um, I don't have a mic. The mic that we used is no longer working, so we're just doing it off of voice through my camera phone or my mic on my camera. You're good. Okay, why don't we go ahead and get started. Uh, this uh, seminar is about uh, understanding different types of electrical in an RV. So this one's going to be an interesting, we'll be talking about four different areas. Uh, one's going to be in 110 electric, 12 volt power, um, charging ways, and also solar and, and boondocking areas. So there's a lot to cover here. 
Uh, this seminar was intended to, oh, by the way, my name's Patrick. Uh, I'm the service manager for Burlington RV. Behind the camera is my wife, Courtney, my beautiful wife, and she's going to be answering all the questions uh, or commenting on all the questions behind there. So if you have any, we do ask that you please hold those questions till the end, which I'll spend some time after the seminar live here going over those questions with you. Uh, we do ask that you hold them to the end because it allows us to get through all that information because there's a lot to go over here. Um, so one of the things that I'd like to start with is uh, on the 110 uh, is I want to start in the 110 area. What we call that is alternating current. And interestingly enough is the creation of alternating current versus DC current, which is 12 volt power. Uh, Thomas Edison created DC power and uh, Tesla created al alternating current power. Now in our homes, we notice that everything's alternating current 110. Uh, in an RV, we use both of those inventions integrated into our RVs. So fun fact, we use both their inventions, inventions in there and utilize them both at the same time, um, but can get tricky. So there's certain things that it's best to understand of what is actually powering up in our units. So that's just a fun fact for you. But starting with 110, we want to go over what's the best things to do for our 110 power coming into our unit. And people always ask me, you know, I want to plug my unit in at home. We know when we go to campsites, uh, we have plugs that are 50 amp, 30 amp, uh, depending on what type of RV we have. Uh, and we want to know what can we do when we're at home or charging or adapters, you know, what is capable and safe for our unit. So if we're adapting down, so say I have a 50 amp and I'm adapting down to what's a 30 amp. And the reason, what I mean by 50 amp is you're gonna have a plug. This is the female version of that plug. Hopefully I'm not too close. Okay. Uh, here and here is 110 and 110 neutral ground. So this is a 50 amp plug. You would have this plug if you had the capability or already have two ACs on your unit because one AC can be on one leg the other AC can be on the other leg. Two ACs can't run on a single leg. That's why if you had a 30 amp plug, you could not run two ACs without doing a lot of electrical work. So this adapter here, if you were to use, if you had a 50 amp service and you're going to use it with the 30 amp at a campsite, because we all know it's very hard to get a campsite right now. And, uh, and sometimes you have to use what they have and you have to adapt down. You can adapt this down, but you have to remember that you only have 30 amps of power. So you no longer have 50, you've just lost 20 amps. So you can't run two ACs, you can't run water heater AC and, and the other amenities that are on at the same time because it could cause that system to fault out or trip. Um, so it's important to know that you're downgrading your amps. Everything in RVs is usually about amps. And uh, you have to be mindful of that. So if you're going to adapt down, which a lot of people are doing right now, I'm getting a lot of calls about it, and they're saying that my breaker's tripping, this is tripping. If you're running the AC and you're downgrading your 30 amp to a 30 amp on a 50 amp service, turn the electric water heater on. Use the gas side of it. Uh, that will save a lot of power. You know, uh, There's things that you can do in the RV to help with that. Now. Here's another one that's big, and this is very important. This is probably the most important thing about the plugs when you're downgrading. Now I want to downgrade to a normal plug that I would get in my house, uh, and I can plug in to power up this RV. Whether I'm going from 30 or 50, here to here, so now I'm downgrading to a uh, 15 amp plug, and some people have adjusted their breakers to put it to 20. Don't ever, I've seen people do it to 25, Putting a larger breaker on a plug like this is bad. Don't do it. Some people said, oh, I'll just change my breaker out to a 30 so I can run what I want. No, that's what that's how fires start. So you don't want to increase your breaker in the house to compensate for the power that you're getting. Leave it the way it is, that's fine. You could plug this in right here, but you have to remember the only thing that can be working when you do this is getting the refrigerator turned on so that way it gets cooled down two days before your trip. Always plug in two days before your trip and charging the batteries through the converter. You can turn your lights on because those are 12 volts and stuff like that, but you can't start turning ACs on, water heaters on electric. You can't do that. It's not, imagine plugging 
Uh, the best way I always explain this is imagine plugging 20 light strings for your Christmas lights off the same plug and turning them all on at the same time. Because that's essentially what you're doing. Not exactly, but essentially the same thing. That will cause the breaker to pop and can cause issues. Am I going to say that you've probably heard out there that people have run their AC off of this 15 amp plug? Yes. I know it's possible and I know you can do it, but it doesn't mean you should. An explanation. This is a light version of this. I have seen it completely melted together. This is a plug, and I do not know if I'm too close. No, you're good. This is a plug that is melted, and this will melt together and it create, could create a fire because when it's running at such a borderline amperage and it gets really hot because we know the ACs when we're running and it's hot outside it's going to continue to run so they adapt down and they run that AC because they have to because they're hot it is dangerous don't do it just use this plug for getting the batteries charged up and uh, which I'll talk a little bit about that part later and uh, getting the fridge cooled because it does take two days to get that fridge cooled per the book um, but most people see it within 12 to 24 hours that it's pretty cold, but the book does says two days, it does say two days. Um, but that's the quartz, and this is really important, so please remember this, don't downgrade to running your AC, but I'm all for downgrading it to get the fridge cold and charge the batteries. Now, the other part that we wanna talk about is surge guards. This is considered a surge guard. Now they have a lot of different ones. This one's from Progressive Dynamics. Um, basically, you would plug this into the post at the campground, then you would plug this uh, into your uh, camper, and then if there was anything dirty power being transferred through, this would stop it from going inside your campground. I've heard a story once where somebody was camping with eight other individuals out there, eight different campers, and a lightning storm came through blew out the power, blew out the transfer case, whatever it did there, it shut down all power to the whole campground. When power was restored, the only person who had power in that camper was the man who had one of these. Um, so they do work, they do save you. This thing will detect immediately if there's a normal operating position, reverse polarity, open ground, low voltage, high voltage uh, on either one and two, and high frequency, low frequency, data leak search guards protection issue. This thing is will detect all that information. Um, and it has saved people. I've even had some customers that had an electrician come out to wire up their uh, plugs so that way they can uh, uh, plug their RVs in at home. Great idea, FYI, great idea, but you need to make sure that they know what they're doing, the electricians, because a lot of people, when they see that end of the plug, their instant thought is 220. This is not 220. Do not shove this into the dryer plug. If you do that, I promise you, you are coming to see me in service and I'm gonna have, it's gonna be a lot of work to fix. Uh, your TVs, anything that turns on 110 is gonna instantly fry. So I've had somebody, didn't understand what was going on, we let him borrow one of these and he went home and checked his plug and instantly, he thought it for sure was in the RV, he instantly found out, now his was a, a ground short bulb was on 220, but it was still a different issue. As soon as he plugged in, this thing showed the fault cord and realized that the air was actually in his plug that was installed. I'm all for installing these plugs at home. I think every RV owner should have one installed, uh, at least to the amperage that they can provide for their RV. I think it's a great idea. Um, I couldn't tell you costs that the electricians do it for, but I don't think it's too bad. Um, but just make sure your electrician knows what you are doing, because a lot of times when they see these plugs, uh, I've had a lot of cases, I'm not saying everyone, there's some guys know exactly what they're doing right when they get out there, but they think this is 220 and they wire you up for it. As soon as you plug in, boom, it's gone. So be, be cautious of that, but these are great things to use, that way you can never cause any real damage through the electrical current uh, on your RV. They also have this in a form that can be hardwired. So, because some people will say, if I put this out there, it can grow legs. Yeah, we have dishonest people out there that may steal something. I've seen people chain these to the poles, um, and I've had seen people say, I don't want this, I want something hardwired into the camper. That can be done to pending room and availability, but that can be done as well. Progressive Dynamics makes it, there's a, probably about 20 other companies that do it too as well. Um, 
Cost-wise, I couldn't answer that unless I saw your unit in the shop uh, because I have to see how it could be installed. So I would just give me a call or give the service advisors a call and uh, they can set up an appointment to have that looked at if you wanted it hardwired. But if you feel comfortable with plugging in and outside, this is a great product to use. I suggest everybody use one. Uh, I know if you've all bought, if everybody here has bought an RV from uh, Burlington RV during the walkthrough, I'm sure they've shown you this because it's important. Now, the other thing I, that I want to go up is, I get a question a lot of times is, what is powered up on 110 or 12 volt current in my RV? Uh, the things that are powered up uh, on 12 volt current is, is most everything in RVs. The one thing that's, it's best to talk about what's actually powered up on 110. The AC is powered up on 110, it can only run if you have 110 power. The uh, TVs is, most TVs, 90% of TVs in trailers are all 110 powered, so they cannot be powered up unless you have 110 power going into the unit. However, there are a few out there that have 12 volt TVs, which is something that can be adapted or converted to. There's lots of ways that can be done. Um, all the 110 outlets, those are all powered up by 110, so you can't, you, unless you do inverter or anything like that, which we'll talk about later, usually those cannot be powered up by plugging, uh, without being plugged in and less inverter. So some units come with them, we'll, we can talk about that later, but most units will not power up that way. Uh, and then um, the microwave. The microwave is also 110 powered. So that can only be operated on 110. Now most other things can be, your refrigerators. If you have a gas and electric refrigerator, the gas can be powered up, but all requires 12 volt power. So most everything else can be powered up off of the 12 volt requiring whether it needs propane or not, but the 12 volt controls it, not 110. So it's good to know those types of information of what you can do, because that would be a good education on your RV, because every RV is different, uh, of what you want to do if you're ever trying to boondock or do those types of things, dry camping. So, which I will talk about dry camping and battery powder in, later in the segment, because that's a larger uh, conversation to have. Um, another one that I want to talk about is charging our batteries um, before we get into boondocking and battery power. Uh, this is, if you ask 10 people, you're going to get 10 different answers. I give you what I believe, um, and what I believe and what I know works, but other people may disagree with me, is I believe that the, a way, an easiest way to charge your batteries up is by using the converter that's provided in the camper. Uh, so when you plug in, that converter, and it's converter, not inverter, converter, and every camper that I've known has one, will take that 110 power and turn it into 12 volt power and charge that battery. Usually they have a 55, 45 amp charger, just depending on what size unit you have. When you plug in, that will charge that battery. Now I always say it's gonna be two days. That two day key is the big thing. 48 hours should get you a full charge on your batteries to the best of those batteries' abilities. So every battery is different depending on how high it'll go. Some go to 75, some people believe 55% is full charge. But two days in advance, we'll charge it through the converter. The reason why I believe that is because I have drained my batteries, I have killed them, I have plugged in on my six volt batteries and I've let it charge two, um, uh, two days and I've gone camping or a week dry camping. So I know it does it. The other way you can do it that other people believe is the best way to charge your batteries is through a trickle charger. Uh, and you can. There's nothing wrong with it. The trickle charger is essentially, in my opinion, the same thing as converter, but some are better than others. So you can buy a fancy trickle charger. It may charge it a little faster. You can hook up a trickle charger on there and charge your batteries that way. Um, some people believe that is the best way to do it. To be honest with you, in my opinion, both ways work. I just think it's easier just to plug in your camper because it's already there. Do I disagree with carrying a trickle charger? No, I think carrying a trickle charger is a great idea because I get a lot of phone calls that a converter has stopped working on them in the middle of the camper. I actually had two calls yesterday about it. Um, I told one person, one was just a fuse issue, but another person, uh, the converter actually failed. So that can really kill a trip because the batteries can only maintain for so long and then they're gonna die if you just have a single 12, 24 volt battery. So. I, carry, I tell people to carry a trickle charger with them in case something like that was to happen. You can plug it into one of the plugs outside 
and then hook it up to your batteries and essentially that will do the same thing as the converter and charge those batteries to keep you camping. Because if you're plugged in and the converter stops working, as soon as that battery dies, you're gonna lose all those amenities that 12 volt powers up, your lights, um, you know, the refrigerator, because even though you're plugged in the fridge and it has 110 fridge, unless you have a residential fridge, it still requires 12 volt to power up. So you will start losing a lot of amenities. So it's a nice little thing to carry with you in case you have a problem. Um, easy thing, most people have one at their house, just throw it in the camper. You may never need to use it, but the day you need to use it and you have it, it's gonna save you your camping trip. Um, moving on. So now we're gonna start talking about um, battery power and solar power. Uh, it's kind of two segments, but kind of rolls into each other. So, sorry, usually I do the, I set this uh, seminar up to be live, in person, uh, so I have a lot more things that I can show you, but since we're live with COVID and everything else uh, um, on, on uh, Facebook, uh, I brought a few things and I'll have to explain a lot of the rest. Um, so battery power, we have, there are about four different types of general batteries that we use in the RV industry. One is our normal lead acid battery, our 12 volt group 24, 27, 31. Uh, that's pretty much been a standard battery installed in campers the last 20 plus years, probably even farther back than that, just as long as I can remember. Um, but as time went on and people started utilizing these campers as a dry camping situation, batteries started to evolve uh, for different purposes. Uh, they also have what's called six volt batteries. Most people call them golf cart batteries because that's what most golf cart batteries uh, or golf carts use that type of battery in their in their golf carts. Those have a, a fairly long amp hour, um, and so that has been the dry camping choice of battery for a long time. Even me, I, I believe in six volt batteries. I carry them in my camper. Um, I think they're great. I think they've been a solid battery for a long time. Um, then came out AGM batteries, which uh, they have 12 volt and six volt. And the plus about those, those are, uh, usually have a higher amperage. Uh, and what I mean by that, I should probably clarify, uh, is amp hours. Each battery is rated by amp hours of how many amps it can get before it's dead. So say a lead acid battery can provide 80 amp hours. So if I was running 80 amps inside my unit, so if I had um, a good example, if I had one light fixture up there that had the incandescent bulbs, not the LEDs they use today, but incandescent, the older style, that is three amps when it's on. That produces three amps of power when it's on. So, sorry, I'm not a mathematician. You guys probably all have your computers in front of you, but if you have an 80 amp hour battery and you're taking three amps with that one light on, divide 80 into three, how many hours do you have? And I, I, what is that, 20 something? So you're gonna be dead in a day and a half or something like that with just that one battery on, not, or that one light on, not anything else. Now in our campers, they kind of switched over to LED unless you have maybe a 10 or 15 year old camper, then it might be still uh, incandescence. LEDs use point, probably you can turn all the lights on and that would match up to that one light because they have, the LED power is just like 0 0.02 of an amp. So, Technology has changed, which helped the battery life and help us last longer out there. Uh, but six volt batteries uh, and AGM batteries, uh, AGMs are cool because they don't gas. So if you didn't have the room up front to put them and you wanted more battery power, you can usually put an AGM battery inside somewhere. And then, and then excuse me, and then they came out with uh, what's called lithium battery, uh, which is new to the industry. Uh, for us, at least on, on, in the Midwest over here, uh, it's starting to become more pronounced. It's probably big out west and it's starting to move its way this way. Uh, we've gotten involved in it. Uh, you know, we're not by any means all experts on it, but uh, we understand it and, uh, and everything's evolving and changing as this technology booms. Uh, and so lithium battery is the new one which I brought. We sell Battleborn batteries. Now, lithium is cool because this one is true amp hours. When we talked about the lead acid battery being 80 amps, um, some, this is a difference of opinion, but some people believe it can only charge to 
50% power, so that means 40 amps is really what's being used. Some people believe 80%, uh, etc., etc. et cetera. I kind of believe 75%, but that, it's all a rough figure. Um, so you're getting about 60 amps of charge. Lithium is true amps, so it will charge to 100%, and this is a 100 amp battery, battery, and it will drain all the way down to zero. So the, the difference between a lithium is I will have full power, like you know how when we're out in there and the lights get dimmer and dimmer and dimmer and dimmer uh, with our 12 volt lead acid batteries? This one will not, it's just like our phones. It just works until the battery's dead and it's off. So it's true power all the way through. Uh, it does require a lot of changes inside your RV to do so. You cannot just buy lithium batteries, pop them in there, and call it a day because the converter is not set up for it. A lot of converters either need an adapter or a replacement because it needs to charge at 14.2 versus 13.7 that our normal converters are set up to charge because that's what a lead acid charge needs to be charged at. So this one right here, is important to use, uh, or is a good idea to use. It can get expensive when you do it. Um, and there's lots of ways that this can be set up. If you're looking into lithium, you're looking at a lot of dry camping. So the only way this is gonna be worth doing is if you're really involved in dry camping. Otherwise, you know, one of the other options is probably best. If you're just planning to do it every once in a while, I wouldn't go with lithium because it's not gonna be cost effective for you. Uh, if you're just saying, oh, maybe, maybe a weekend here or a weekend there throughout the whole summer, I might use a dry, dry camp. I'd rather set something else for you than these lithiums because the value would not be there for what it costs. If you're planning to go all summer dry camping, then we would need to talk about this type of system. And then, uh, battery power, people always ask me, how long can I last? How long can I last on battery power out there? Uh, everything's about the amps, like we talked about. I can't answer that question. And if anybody says that they can answer that question, they're either a heck of a mathematician or they're just guessing. Because I, wouldn't, I can spend two different weekends out there battery camping with battery power, and I could last different times each time because it's all in what we use and how we use it. If I turn an extra couple lights on, you know, it's gonna drain my power that much faster. So it's all in what we use that will last us. I like to tell people that, and this is the original, not lithium, if we're talking full dry camping, that's a whole different setup, but just the normal everyday dry camping that you wanna do every once in a while, I always recommend just putting a couple six volt batteries in there. The average amp hour for a six volt battery is 120. I know there's different batteries out there that get higher or lower, but the average is 120 amps per hour before it's dead. You have to put two of them because they're six volt batteries. You have to put two because you need to make it 12 volts. If you just hook one six volt battery up there, that's bad. That means you're only putting six volts into your system. And so if you have two of them, you're gonna put that in what's called series. So you're gonna put a negative to a positive. Strip one, one battery you have here, the other battery you have here, you go negative, and then the other battery you'll put it to the positive and then pretend that those two batteries is one battery because that will now increase it to 12 volts. And then uh, you're gonna have the negative and the positive over here and just pretend like these don't exist, it's one battery. That's the easiest way to view it. Uh, and then you would just take the positive off of the camper right to there, the negative off the camper to there, 12 volt power through there, and you have on average uh, 220 amp hours before it's dead. That's a lot of amp hours. I can make that last. I mean, I can't tell you how long you could, but I know if I was out there, I could probably make it last me a week doing what I do, you know? But if you're out there, put a plugging an inverter in there and watching a movie, that's all gonna change that battery power. So that's just saying what I've been able to do in the past uh, as an idea, but I can never tell you how long you last. I always recommend people to put two six volt batteries in there to start out to see about dry camping. And then from there, we can add to whatever accommodation you need. Um, there's one, like, so if we get into the inverter stage and you want to power up some plugs off of the 12 volt power, I can add an inverter in there. Um, I can do a lot by adding power. I usually, the highest I will personally go uh, in the dealership right now 
is I will go to breakers on the, and what I mean by that is if I have an inverter, I'll take a line off of the breaker panel and I'll, and you could pick two of those breakers and I can power them up. Uh, that's the max that I will do right now. I know there's other technology out there. Um, and two of those breakers that I choose cannot be an AC. I won't be an AC because that 2000 watt one is not going to do it. And two, it's just, it's, it's technology that's out there. Yes, I can increase the uh, inverter and possibly make that happen, but, and maybe a, a year from now I may change my mind, but it's still new technology to me and I'd like to see more research being done. Uh, I know people are doing it out there. I just wanna get more information before we jump into that area. So realistically in our shop, what we'll do right now is we'll power up two of those breakers. So if you want some TVs working and the microwave working, we can make that happen off of 12 volt power. Um, Anything more than that, we would we would probably want to look into. Uh, we we could talk about it and see what what you have, but more than likely, if you're trying to power up an AC at this point in time, I usually won't do that in the shop until I get more research from that. Not saying it's not possible because it is. Um, and then solar, uh, solar is another area that, that that's been around a long time. Love solar, been doing it for years. Um, I love Zamp Solar. I usually have a panel here. I'm sorry I'm at my house, so I don't have a panel here. It was kind of big to carry. Um, but uh, Zamp Solar, I usually start off with the, I don't like using those little ones that come out. Uh, you know, it's all about the amps, like I talked about, or like I said earlier. And those little ones produce 1.5 amps, 2 amps of charge. Uh, not a whole lot, if we remember that whole light with the incandescent bulbs puts is three amps. So if I have a two amp uh, uh, solar panel, I'm only lighting half that light. So the little ones I usually tell people to stay clear of, um, for me, my personal opinion, I just, unless you're gonna use it as a maintainer when it's stored, uh, then I, I just don't see the value in it. If you're looking for a use to actually dry camp with it, I always re recommend using, to start out using the Zamp Solar 170 watt panel with 8.9 amps of charge and that will come with a 30 amp controller so if that one panel is not doing the trick and you're still killing those batteries I can add another panel to it up to 30 amps so that'll give you a total of three panels up there so you know there's lots of areas you can go and I love talking about these types of areas but every camper is different Every single camper has different amenities and the way that it would have to be set up. So there's, there's, I would have, when we talk about this and you're thinking about doing any type of dry camping, it's almost needs a consultation on exactly what your camper is. And we'd have to sit down with the service advisors or you'd have to sit down with the service advisors or myself and talk about a plan of what you would like done and have a, and go from there. But we would really need to see the camper in order to do it correctly. So we can have ideas of, we can do this, we can do that, but, Sitting down, seeing what you want is the most important thing to do. Um, I'm trying to think if uh, um, lithium on these lithium batteries. I was going to say. Now, uh, there one other thing I want to talk about. Sorry, about the 12 volt power, like 12 volt batteries. Let's pretend this is a lead acid battery. If you wanted to put two 12 volt batteries together, that would be considered parallel. So what I would do is I would link them positive to positive, negative to negative. So this is the positive, sorry, it's so hard to see. Positive and negative, and say I had another battery right here, positive and negative, I would put a line here, and I'd put a line here. And that would just parallel it. If I put in series and did the, what I did with the six volts on the 12 volt battery, I would then create, I hope everybody's saying it right now, 24 volts, bad. Bad to do, okay, in some boats I heard, but. In RVs, we don't have anything that's set up that way. Um, so basically what we would wanna do is uh, parallel these, and then this is a difference of opinion. This is what I like to do. I like to take still the lead off of the uh, uh, camper on here. Some people like to put the negative over here and just piggyback the second battery. I'm more of a fan of putting the negative over here, so that way when it's putting a charge from the converter, it's equally charging both batteries at the same time instead of just charging this one and piggybacking over on the other one. 
kind of gives an overload of a charge on here. 35 year veteran technician told me that makes logical sense. So I always say it's best just to put the other lead over here so you can have a circle charge as long as you're going positive. I'm sorry, positive, positive, negative, negative. Um, that's uh, a lot of the information. I'd like to open up for a few questions here and uh, go over it. Uh, some of the questions that you guys have. Um, I'm sure we can probably elaborate from there. So I have a couple. If you, you may hear it twice, I'm sorry. i uh, used to doing this live, so you may hear my wife talking. <laughs> I changed my converter after accidentally plugging into a 220 volt, still not charging the battery. However, battery gets charged by a car battery charger and by the tow vehicle. Okay, um, I'm gonna say it again just because I'm pretty sure that you've heard her, but I'll just say it again just to make sure. Um, the person is stating they accidentally plugged into the 220 um, and it blew the converter, which is exactly probably what would happen. And so they changed the converter out and uh, they're still not getting a charge to the battery. Um, and the only way it's charging is from the car or I guess an outside charger, which would be fine. Um, now there's two things there. There's two things that I'd like to talk about. Number one, if you hooked up to 220 and the converter went out, you might want to check a few other the items to make sure they're working just to be safe. I'm sure you have. It's probably since you've already replaced the converter, you've already been through everything. But if you've replaced that converter and that converter just goes from the breaker box down to that converter and then out to the batteries, uh, and it's still not working, um, you might want to check the breaker on the actual box to make sure that it's passing power. If you put a new one in there, there's no reason why it shouldn't be working because that's by itself. It just goes from the 110 power plugged in, into the breaker box, out through the breaker, and to, sorry, I'm doing all the hand signals, and to the uh, converter, and then out to the batteries. So realistically speaking, there's no reason why it shouldn't work if you've already replaced it. Uh, so I would check, make sure it was done, hooked up correctly, or also the other thing you can check just to make sure is at the front of, if you have a, I don't know what kind of camper this is, but say it's an A-frame trailer or maybe a fifth wheel, before the batteries, at, right at the battery, before the battery is always like a 30 amp breaker. If you're on an A-frame trailer, usually I follow the positive lead off the battery, I'll run into an inline fuse and that's a 30 amp fuse. That could be blown because if that's blown, then that's not going to charge the battery. Um, but in tents, I don't think that would be the case because you still have power after you're hooking up to the car and inside you have power. So that would kind of kill that power inside too. So I would probably suggest for that one to have our techs look at it because something may not be right. As for the other thing you stated about the car charging the battery, yes, the car will send a charge back to the battery, but please do not rely on that. Uh, that, that car is designed to charge the engine battery and send a little trickle charge back. Uh, and it will give a maintainer. Uh, that's what I like to call it. So if you are, hence, maybe running the fridge while you're driving, which is not supposed to be, but 95% of America does that, uh, but it's not supposed to be, um, you're maintaining that battery power as it's going, but maybe you have an inverter that's charging the, uh, or keeping the maintainer for your household refrigerator as you're driving. So the battery is, or the car is meant to charge the, uh, just to maintain the inner inside of the um, camper. I never want you to use the car instead of plugging in two days in advance because if you're trying to jet dry camp or anything, it's gonna be bad. If you're going somewhere to plug in, probably not gonna affect you very much, but if you were just using the car to charge and get there, it probably won't last very long. But as for the converter, I definitely bring it in because if you've replaced it, something's not right. Okay, I have two questions. One from the same person. Um, she said, do all 12 volt power go through the battery first before going to the 12 volt circuit? My 12 volt completely shuts down when plugged in from shore power, except for the slide out. Wonder if that was by design or someone possibly mo modified it. No, uh, I'm, I'm going to repeat that. I know you guys heard that, but uh, the person asked that is all the 12 volt circuit going through the 12 volt power, I think from the converter charging it. Uh, when plugged in because my com circuit completely shuts down that same thing uh, Can can that person ask me 
uh, can I find out what kind of camper this is? Because that will really define the answer that I can give you. If, if that person could quote in real quick and just say what kind of camper it is. Um, Mike said, mobile homes, vehicle battery connection to camper battery. Vehicle battery loses charge even when plugged in. What is the inter what interconnect the, device oh, called? What was the, la the last question that the person, that, I want to jump to that one next, so I don't want to bounce around. That, that's the next question. No, what camper that person had. They didn't answer. Oh, okay. Um, so the next question. Okay, I'll, I'll come back to that one. Just keep that one handy and go to that next question that you said, sorry. Mike said mobile homes vehicle battery connection to camper battery. Vehicle battery loses charge even when plugged in. What is the interconnect device called? Uh, I'm not sure I follow that question. Um, uh, some, first of all, in the mobile home, is this, are we talking what type of camper is that? Basically, from the car, I, I'll try to answer this. I, I'm not sure I can follow the question on this one, but from the car, your 12 volt line is a charge line that comes out, and I hate to use the word charge, I like to say maintainer line, that comes out of the back of the seven way plug, and then that will go in through the seven way and then go straight to the battery, sending amperage back there to help charge that battery uh, or maintain that battery. Uh, it basically goes through that seven way and back up through the battery. It would be located on the seven way plug as the uh, top post right before that little angle. Uh, it just goes straight through as a straight wire. Wire, sorry. And it has a, it's fused actually in the truck. Um, I'm not sure if I answered that one correctly. I wasn't too sure of that question. Mike said the, oh, Jayco Melbourne is the one that he's talking about. Okay, so it's, okay, he's got a motor home. So you're wondering if the engine's charging through, and uh, what that is called, okay, that makes more sense. Sorry, I, I didn't understand that one. Uh, if you have a, if that vehicle is capable of charging from the engine battery to, uh, to the house batteries, which some do, some do not, okay? It depends on how the manufacturer wired up. But what that is called is a tram bed relay. And that's what's used to transfer that power. It's just a solenoid that is told to open up because it detects power. It's a pretty simple system. To be honest with you, they use Trambetti relays on all kinds of stuff. Uh, my lawnmower has a Trambetti relay. Now, it's not doing the same purpose of what you're talking about, but it is a very common product. If you type it in in Google, you will see it. Uh, I'm sure yours has one. It's a round cylinder, four posts. Some of them even come with fuses on the side to power up the... Uh, uh, radio, um, uh, where it's located, I'd have to see your unit to tell you, but I could find it. The same, the same person said how to check fuse. For the... Jayco Melbourne. I would have to see it because I don't know where it's located on the Melbourne. I usually have to get in there and look. Um, it's, I've seen them under the hood on the right side, uh, down below, and there's usually an inline fuse there for that. I've also seen them uh, by the steps uh, when you open up a panel. Uh, I've seen them, I've replaced them in both areas. Uh, that's the most common place I've seen them. Um, but I don't know on each model where everything is. Uh, I have to go look for it uh, whenever a unit comes in the drive. There's just so many models. It's impossible for me to remember where everything's at. But those are the common areas of where I see it. Going back to the previous um, customer, she said, it is a 30-foot R-Vision that only the slide-out will work when unplugged. Okay, so it's an R-Vision. So when unplugged, I can almost guarantee what you have is a breaker or fuse that's going to, I wish I had one here to show you, but it, they're saying basically when they plug it, when they're unplugged, the only thing that will work is the slide-out. Nothing else in that camper will work when they unplug. That's because that slide-out is... It either could be a hydraulic pump slide out or just a direct feed to the battery. And that means that that is wired separate from the actual converter system. So you're not getting any power uh, from the battery to the converter. So when you're plugging in, you have all your lights working, that's because your converter is physically working. So there is a break in the line from the battery to the converter breaker or to the breaker panel where the converter is set up at. And more than likely your problem 
is going to be located. Uh, our vision, I think, has just, bear with me on this one because I don't sell the our vision, but uh, it's either a fifth wheel, I believe. Uh, I might be wrong on that, but even A-frame, same concept. It's usually right next to the battery. If you follow the battery positive lead off of the battery, you'll run right into what's either a gray two-post, uh, what they call a little uh, breaker, uh, but it, there's no reset there, or it'll be an inline fuse. More than likely, that is popped. Uh, I'm, I'm, I would be almost 90% sure that that's what your issue is. You would just have to follow it back from the positive lead off the battery. Dan Loop said, if you dry camp, can the fridge only run on gas? And if not, why is it peeping when power from the campground goes down? Uh, beeping? It says peeping, but maybe beeping. Okay. Um, Mr. Loops asked uh, if uh, uh, when he's dry or when he's camping and say the power goes down, he starts hearing a beep uh, when he's dry camping. Um, if the beep, there's two beeps, so if the beep is coming from the refrigerator and the power went down, it's because you're in auto, which is exactly where I want you to be. But you're in auto, and when the power is reduced, when you unplug, it then switches over to gas. But gas is only to hold pressure for three minutes, so it can dissipate pressure. So a lot of times, we all know this, we have to start the stove or the, and get the flame going to pass the gas through to get everything through the lines. So if it tried to light and you hear the beeping and it was only trying to light air, it's not uncommon that you have to turn the fridge off, turn it back on and let it try again. Uh, I have said that for years. I actually won't consider the fridge not lighting a failure unless it doesn't light after turning it off and on three times. So, and that's a great question, Mr. Lewis, because a lot of people will just unplug the camper and head on out, you know, and what, if they didn't check that, then obviously it, it could be out and it's just getting warm inside there. Um, so it is definitely something you should go look at and make sure if that's the beeping you're talking about coming from the refrigerator itself. Now, if it's a beeping coming from the LP detector and it just does this, beep, beep, like that, it's not wailing at you because if it's wailing at you, that means that there's an LP leak, get out. But if it's just doing that every once in a while beep, that means you have a low battery. Uh, not the battery in the LP, your actual 12 volt battery is low. That's the indicator telling you that. So it is important to uh, charge your battery. Uh, it does worry me that if you heard the beeping from the LP detector after you unplugged, that would tell me that there's probably a problem, either a battery or whatever the case may be, because you've been plugged in this whole time, it should be fully charged. You should not hear a beep from the LP detector. But the refrigerator one, that's the beep that you would hear, and that's probably the common cause. Um, Mike said he will, going back to the Jayco Melbourne, mm -hmm. said that, um, he believes the Transetti relay may be under the driver's seat, and he has a couple other electrical issues, so he's going to contact you and just come in. Okay. Um, Mike said that, uh, I'm sure you, you probably can hear my wife Sorry. a lot better because <laughs> she's standing right next to the phone, so I'm sure I'm just repeating this for no reason. But uh, he said that there's probably some other, and which you could be right, uh, and if it's under the driver's seat, yeah, definitely bring it on in, and uh, uh, we can set up a fun and take a look at it. Um, but yeah. Um, does anybody else have any solar questions or dry camping questions or things that they're thinking about that they want to ask? Give me one solar question. I love talking about solar. Anything? <laughs> okay. Um, uh, we'll keep... Uh, I'm not obviously, as you can tell, I'm not in the office today. Um, I will be back in on Monday if... Uh, oh. Are flexible solar panels okay to use? Okay, somebody asked if flexible panels are okay to use. Sometimes you have to use those. Um, 
if, if they're curved roofed or I can't put the plates down uh, because they're so curved, you have to use flexible panels. And yeah, they're great. Zamp Seller sells flexible or the, the hard panel. Um, they're, they're both good. I have no problems with either or. So they're actually changing some of the technology that's actually increasing on amperage on some of those flexible ones. Uh, every day technology is changing, so I'm, I'm for them all the time. I've installed a few. Uh, Mr. Lutz said, is solar a waste of money if you never dry camp? Yeah, Mr. Lutz said, is solar a waste of money if you never dry camp? In my personal opinion, there is no reason to have solar if you are never going to dry camp. There's no reason to actually increase batteries if you are never going to dry camp because you're going to be plugged in at some point. So the battery uh, it just needs to be the basic battery. You, you just need something to maintain you for short periods of time. So yes, I would say I would not waste any money into solar if you're never going to dry camp. And then um, Mike asked where to connect PV solar. Uh, portable is that what I'm, PV, I'm sure PV means portable solar. Uh, where to connect portable solar? Uh, you can connect that directly straight to the battery, but please, if you're buying a portable solar panel, make sure it has some sort of internal. Uh, controller uh, like Zamp Solar sells a fold out one that you could hook straight to the battery and it has a, a controller in there and it's important to have that because you need to be able to it needs to know when to shut down you don't want to continue to charge that battery when it's fully charged it's gonna cook it so you got to have some sort of controller just don't wire up a panel and call it a day and the same customer said do they have to be permanently mounted uh, that's what I'm saying if he has is a mic right Mike asked uh, if it has to, if it has to be permanently mounted. No, it's just easier uh, to deal with it. See the permanently photo. I'm gonna butcher this. Photovoltaic. I don't, I don't know what that means. I'm probably butchering it. Sorry, I'm probably <laughs> butchering it. So I apologize. Uh, I don't. Oh, Mr. Pitt. I don't know. Do you still want it? Yeah, I would probably talk to you Monday. I'm not sure about that question right there. Um, I'd have to find out. I'd have to find out. And the other question that you had about permanently mounted on the roof, I just like to do only permanently mounted roof ones because the fold out ones usually don't produce enough power to dry camp. And when somebody's really dealing in solar, you want to get panels that are actually going to do the job. And those panels are usually the ones that are bigger and heavier and you can't really carry them around. Uh, maybe in the future some of the technology will change, but I would put the uh, uh, panels up on the roof. But sorry, I do not know the answer to that other question. I'd like to dig more into that uh, when we talk on Monday. Um, and then a customer said, I hope I'm saying their name right, I, Ivalo said, could you talk a little bit about generators for dry camping, please? <laughs> Thank you. For, somebody asked, uh, can you talk a little bit more about generators for dry camping? I completely missed that segment in the actual seminar. Uh, I even brought something for it so I can talk about generators, so thank you. <laughs> I actually forgot about that. Um, I'm going to bring this closer. I couldn't bring a generator with me, uh, but generators for dry camping are great to use. I'm just bringing this so you guys can see it. Uh, this is what I recommend is the Yamaha 2000. and. Uh, I brought this with me. This is obviously just a, a kit, but it's just all I wanted was the picture so you can see it. Um, is uh, Generators are great to have out there. The Yamaha has about a 52 dBAs, um, so it's pretty quiet. Um, the other one that's coming out on the market is from Onam, which has been in generators for 20 plus years in RVs. They're now coming out with a carry out one just like this 2000. That's another one you can go with. Um, What's important about generators is that you must use pure sine wave generators. And they're a great thing to use. And the reason why I say pure sine waves, if you're getting that construction generator and they don't have a pure sine waves to give a nice smooth current power, and you know how the engines go up and down as they're, dry, as they're running. And if you don't have a pure sine wave in inverter on that generator, that's what your appliances are doing and it's gonna cause havoc to them in the long run. So make sure you use a pure sine wave generator. I just recommend Onam and Yamaha because that's what I've been using for the last 12 years and they've been uh, solid for me. The 2000 watt uh, generator from Onam is new. 
I have yet to sell one of those, but the onboard gens that Onan's been using have been great for years, so I hope they came out with just a great product on that. Um, I'm trying to get some in stock. COVID has kind of made it a little bit more difficult for me to get that stuff in stock, but we're working on that. Uh, if you are going to use a generator, which is awesome, yes, some of the campgrounds will not allow it. This is true. So be mindful of that. They'll tell you no. Um, but if you do use a generator, I always recommend buying two, two, 2,000 watt generators. So two of these things. Two of these right here. And they're 2,000 watt generators. And then you can get a linkage kit. A linkage kit that will allow it to have 30 amps. Because we need to be able to get to that 30 amp source that we talked about earlier so we can run the AC. You cannot run the AC off of one of these. Hence, yes, I know it might be possible, but should not be done because it's only a 15 amp source, source per one generator. You must get two to link it. Uh, they have other generators out there that, um, like the 3500 watt boost Yamaha will also has 30 amps by itself and you can run everything run your AC off of that but it's pretty bulky and heavy so that's why I say these I call them suitcase generators because you could just I can carry both of them and walk around they're not bad they're easy to store and I can use them for other things in a quick pinch so Yamaha generators are, have always been a go-to for me uh, they've worked well I've never had any of them come back except with an issue um, and They've just been a solid product. So I might be switching because the cost is more effective on the Onan generators uh, for the 2000 watts. They're a little cheaper. They're a little unknown charted for the 2001, but their onboard generators that they've been using for years on motorhomes and, and fifth wheels have been solid. You know, they, they do have their areas of issues from time to time because they are uh, sitting for most of the time, but uh, they've been a good generator all in all. And they've been real dedicated to the RV industry. Hope that answers your question then thank you because i missed that one on the seminar that was actually on my list i even brought a product to even talk about it uh if there are any other questions uh, i'll give it about another couple minutes uh if um i just uh, like to thank everybody for logging on and listening and uh if you have any questions later on, please don't post them on the, uh, after we end this feed, uh, please don't post them on the, the comment section. Please call us at the dealership. Uh, you know, it'd be better for, uh, that way we can actually get a response for you because we don't monitor this feed after it's over. Um, one person, um, Lisa asked if you could please hold up that Yamaha generator just for a little bit longer so she can get a screenshot. And then how about LP gas generators? Maybe lower it a teeny bit. Yeah. There you go. Um, LP gas generators. Okay. Um, LP gas generators, uh, that's usually done by uh, Onan. Uh, and those are usually onboard generators. Uh, somebody asked about LP generators. Um, and uh, maybe benefits, I guess, was what you're asking. An LP generator is something that we would use if it was using an Onan onboard generator. You were planning to permanently mount this to the actual uh, unit. Um, my suggestion, my honest suggestion is if you don't already have a generator mounted into your unit, it's best just to buy the Yamaha suitcases or something along those lines. Uh, the cost to install one on an LP Onan generator inside the unit is pretty high. Um, it is more cost effective to buy these than the onboard LP generator. We will do it, but um, you know you're going to want to keep that camper for a while because it could cost upwards of six, seven, eight grand to do that to add one to uh, an LP generator Onan to the unit. But those are the only LP generators that I know of. Uh, maybe there's some other stuff out there. I don't research everything, but that's just what the RV industry usually uses. It looks like that's all the questions. Uh, if you guys have any more or you're watching this not live and you're just watching it later on, um, you know, please give us a call in the store. Uh, if you have any questions, as for we do not follow this feed after the, the, 
uh, the seminar has ended and uh, we'll go from there. What are your thoughts on running your oh, onboard? One more question, sorry. What are your thoughts on running your onboard generator when on the road to run AC? Uh, what are my thoughts on running the onboard generator on the road when you're driving? It is hot out there. Absolutely. Uh, that dash AC doesn't do the trick when it's 190 degrees outside. So you want to, you're comfortable. If you're the driver, you're all right. You probably don't have to, but the, the people back there might, might really want you to. Um, so yes, I'm all for running the generator while you're driving down the road. If I'm camping with you and I'm sitting in the back, I'm going to make you run the generator while I'm driving down the road because I don't want to sweat. Um, now, the one thing you do need to keep in mind is that it's going to obviously ruin your gas mileage. Uh, but if you're worried about a gas mileage and a, and a pusher or a gas model on, on, or anything and with the trailer on the back of it, you're already not getting the greatest here regardless. Um, but uh, basically I would run it. You need to know that it will shut down at a quarter tank of gas. So if you have a motor home and you're running that generator at a quarter tank of gas, it's over, it's, it's gonna shut off. So, and the reason for that is they don't want people dry camping out there running that generator and then allowing it to run your gas all the way out. That's why they cut it off a quarter so you can still make it to any gas station. And someone asked, oh, she said even with a fifth wheel. Fifth wheel, uh, even with the fifth wheel, is, is that for the- Same question. Same right? question with uh, right. running it uh, while you're driving down the road? Uh, well. I guess I wouldn't understand if it's a fifth wheel, if you were driving down the road, I don't see why you would want to run the generator with the AC going. Um, I, I hope you don't have people back there. I know some states make it legal if you have a walkie talkie, but I can, can you imagine what would happen if somebody hit the brakes abruptly in a trailer and you were back there, I promise your body would go through a wall. So, I hope nobody's back there if you're running around in the AC because of pet or animal. I really not recommend that either, uh, unless with without being able to observe them of some sort or keep some sort of digital. Carrying pets. Yeah, if you're carrying pets, I don't recommend that unless you have a, some sort of technology in there to allow you to monitor the temperature inside there because what if the gas generator shuts down on you or turns off on you and you're driving, you're never going to know. You're never gonna know about it, and if that, and it gets hot. It's a hot box back there. So I would strongly recommend putting some sort of, they have a lot of stuff out there that you can adapt to your, uh, your phone nowadays, that you can hook a, a climate control in there, and then you can run the generator while you're driving down the road, but I, if you're keeping pets back there and you're not able to be, which I do not want you back there, I still don't recommend putting pets back there in a fifth wheel because you can't monitor it, and there's abrupt stops, they get tossed around just like people would. So, I mean, that's a call that you would have to make. She but... said thank you. Oh, okay. Um, and then one person said, um, can solar be used for trickle charging? Uh, solar, yeah, absolutely. Can solar be used for trickle charging? Absolutely. Absolutely, that's what it is for. Looks like that's all the questions we have. Uh, I'd like to thank everybody for tuning in and watching. And uh, if you have any questions, like I say, please just call the dealership. Uh, we'll be, I'll be back in on Monday if you have questions for me. Um, and we'll go from there. Stay tuned earlier, later on, uh, we are gonna do some how-to videos. Uh, we will be posting that. I'm gonna try to get those out uh, this month, uh, maybe a couple more. We did a de-winterize. I'm gonna try to do some other ones out there and uh, go from there. So if you have any uh, uh, questions, just give us a call and I thank you all for joining. Have a good day.